with me. For the next hour, I'm going to be going over basic science for the Miller Review course, JBJS recertification course. These are my disclosures. These are the resources I use to collect this information and present this to you. And my slide acknowledgments as far as my figures. So basic science, today we'll be covering bone and cartilage metabolism, disorders of bone and cartilage, some perioperative problems, and some medical ethics. I like to think that basic science is the low-hanging fruit of this uh, test. It's very easily testable. Uh, a lot of genes and proteins, pathways, several rare but representative conditions that are easily testable, as well as definitions. So we'll start with bone. Bone's got several important functions. Most importantly, it provides mechanical support for the skeleton and for the body, mineral homeostasis, and also houses the marrow elements. It's a living material composed of both cells as well as an extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix has three phases I think we should remember. The inorganic phase, the organic phase, and the liquid or aqueous phase. The inorganic phase composes approximately 60% of the dry weight of bone. The most important mineral here is calcium hydroxyapatite. For whatever reason, the chemical structure of this has been tested before and is listed here. The organic matrix of bone contains about 40% of the dry weight. The majority of the organic matrix is type 1 collagen, also proteoglycans, which pr pr provide some compressive force, and matrix, pr matrix proteins. Remember, bone, B-O-N-E, is type 1 collagen. Collagen is a main structural protein in connective tissue. It's composed of chains of hydroxyproline uh, that forms a triple helix of three interwoven chains of these proteins. It's important to remember that vitamin C hydroxylates proline into hydroxyproline to compose uh, collagen. Scurvy would be an example of vitamin C deficiency. Collagen is strong and very flexible. It provides a tensile strength for bone and other connective tissues. There's very many types of collagen. Uh, I think the ones that are most important for uh, musculoskeletal uh, uh, physicians or orthopedic surgeons are types 1 and type 2. Type 1 is bone, skin, fibrocartilage, and the intervertebral disc, at least the annulus fibrosis of it. Type 2 collagen is the softer materials of cartilage, the nucleus propulsus of the, uh, of the disc as well. It's important to remember that collagen type 1 is bone, the fibrocartilage and other structures such as tendon and ligaments. Uh, type 2 is going to be the articular cartilage, and this figure just demonstrates that nicely. Again, remember type 1, B-O-N-E, bone is type 1 collagen. So I put some slides in here as well, which are going to go over some basic science conditions. These are conditions that are easily testable, and they have uh, specific uh, manifestations that are easily testable in the question stem, and are normally associated with a specific cr uh, chromosome abnormality, gene mutation, pathway error, or again, a clinical manifestation. So osteogenesis imperfecta, this is a type 1 collagen defect. We're just talking about collagen, so it makes sense to start with this. It's abnormal collagen cross-linking via glycine substitution in pro-collagen. There's several different types. Type 1 is the most common. If you ever watch the TV show The Middle, the child on the middle has type 1 osteogenesis imperfecta. This is an autosomal dominant condition. It's a mild manifestation of this. These patients have easily broken bones. Ehlers Danlos syndrome is a, is a condition that many of us see frequently in orthopedic surgery. There's a, over a dozen different mutations that's caused this. The most collagen collagen types are types 1, types 3, and type 5. This is all abnormal collagen or abnormal linking of the collagen. We see this as abnormal joint hypermobility, stretchy skin, and vascular problems. You should avoid soft tissue procedures in isolation in these patients as they are, as they are uh, prone to failure. Spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia is another collagen disorder. In this case, it's type 2 collagen. There's two types, a TARDA type, which is x linked recessive, and a congenital type, which is autosomal dominant. This is, uh, the manifestation of this is short trunk and short limbs. These patients are mentally normal, uh, such as this actor here, Warwick Davis. So we're going to talk, talk about bone cells now. The main types of bone cells are listed here. You have osteoprogenitor cells, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. The progenitor cells are the stem cells which become bone cells. Osteoblasts are the immature cells that form bone. Osteocytes are the mature bone cells which maintain bone. And osteoclasts are actually a different lineage. These resorb bone. And the interplay between these different cells is important for bone metabolism. So osteoblasts, the lineage from osteoblasts, they all come from mesenchymal stem cells. That's the lineage. These undergo... Uh, uh, um, uh, 
a transcription growth factors will, will tell them basically to turn into osteoprogenitor cells, which will become osteoblasts. The important transcription factors here to remember are RUNX2 and CBFA1. Uh, those uh, transcription factors are what uh, tell the mesenchymal stem cells to become osteoprogenitor cells. It's important to remember that mesenchymal stem cells can form a variety of different cell types, including osteoblasts, chondrocytes, myocytes, and adipocytes based on the transcription factors to which they're exposed. So RUNX2 and CBFA1, this is the multifunctional transcription factor that directs the mesenchymal stem cell to the osteoblast lineage. It's important to remember that both uh, RUNX2 and CBFA1 are important as well as Osterix and ATF4 are also involved. In the absence of RUNX2 and OSX, no osteoblasts are formed. Clinocradial dysplasia is a, is a syndrome which occurs when you have a defect of CBFA, CBFA1 or RUNX2. It's an autosom autosomal dominant condition which manifests as uh, absent clavicles and cranial malformations. It affects intramembranous ossification. That's why the clavicle and the, uh, and the, skull and the uh, bones of the skull are affected. Again, you have broad head and absent clavicles. BMP or bone morphogenic protein is an another important transcription factor to know. It's an osteoinductive growth factor which stimulates bone formation. It stimulates mesenchymal stem cells to become osteoprogenitor cells. There are several different types of recombinant BMPs that have been utilized, including BMP2 and BMP7. Uh, BMP2 is uh, FDA approved for acute open tibial fractures, although it's used in a variety of different orthopedic procedures. The osteoblast is the important uh, cell that, uh, that forms osteoid, essentially. Its main functions are it forms bone and also regulates osteoclasts. It basically directs bone metabolism via a number of different pathways. Osteoblasts secrete type 1 collagen. Again, remember type 1, B-O-N-E, type 1 collagen. The markers you have in osteoblasts include the following, alkaline phosphatase, osteocalcin, osteonectin, and osteopontin. Osteocalcin is the most abundant non-collagenous protein in bone. This is frequently tested. The receptors in osteoblasts are many. Again, osteoblasts control a lot of the bone metabolism you see uh, um, by different pathways and different receptors. Parathyroid hormone, this um, is an important one. It stimulates osteoclasts. It should be noted that uh, pulsed parathyroid hormone actually stimulates osteoblasts. So cons a consistent parathyroid hormone will actually stimulate osteoclasts, whereas pulsed parathyroid hormone will stimulate osteoblasts. Terapartide, or Forteo, is a synthetic parathyroid hormone used to stimulate osteoblasts and osteoporosis. Other uh, receptors include vitamin D, prostaglandins, and estrogen, and the interplay between these different receptors are important for bone metabolism. You should know that estrogens uh, in the postmenopausal state, uh, the lack of estrogen uh, will cause, uh, can cause postmenopausal osteoporosis. The WNT pathway is an important pathway as well. This is a protein that promotes osteoblast survival and proliferation. It binds to a lipo lipoprotein related protein 5 and 6, or LRP5 and 6. Deficient WNT results in osteopenia whereas high WNT results in high bone mass. WNT is sequestered by sclerostin and by dickoff related protein 1. So sclerostin is an important uh, substance in that it sequesters WNT. This is secreted by osteocytes and provides negative feedback on osteoblasts. If you have increased sclerostin, you have decreased bone formation. Therefore, a sclerostin antibody used pharmacologically may improve uh, bone density or enhance fracture repair. And this is an area of, uh, of research for, um, um, for bone formation. The osteocyte is a mature bone cell. It forms 90% of the cells in the mature skeleton. These are former osteoblasts which are now trapped in the matrix. Uh, these maintain bones. They have mechanosensing and control uh, extracellular concentration of calcium and phosphorus. These are directly stimulated by calcitonin and they're inhibited by parathyroid hormone. These communicate to each other via canaliculi. So we've talked about the osteoblasts which help to create bone. The osteoclasts help to resorb bone. So the interplay between these two is important for bone turnover. The osteoclast is a multinucleated bone resorbing cell. It does not come from a mesenchymal stem cell lineage. In fact, it comes from a monocyte lineage. It's more of a hematopoietic cell. This resorbs mineralized bone matrix in these areas called Halship's lacuna, as demonstrated on this slide, uh, histology slide. 
Again, these are, uh, these are not mesenchymal cells. They come from hematic uh, hematopoietic uh, lineage. They are regulated by osteoblasts. Differentiation requires rank ligand and macrophage colony stimulating uh, uh, hormone. Uh, these are transcription factors created by osteoblasts. Again, osteoclasts have a ruffled border. They bind to the bone via integrins. They, there's two substances that, are, that I think are important for osteoclasts to remember, carbonic anhydrase and cathepsin K. The carbonic anhydrase helps to create hydrogen ions which dissolve the mineralized bone matrix. So, th so this is what uh, is how the osteoclast can break down the inorganic phase of the bone matrix uh, into their respective minerals. Cathepsin K is a lysosomal enzyme which dissolves the proteins and collagen or the organic phase of bone. So again, carbonic, uh, carbonic anhydrase dissolves the inorganic phase and cathepsin K the organic phase. These two are important for uh, bone turnover. Disorders of this, such as osteopetrosis, which is osteoclast dysfunction caused by uh, dysfunctional carbonic anhydrase, uh, is going to result in dense, hard, and brittle bone. These patients have fractures, anemia, and hepatosplenomegaly. They can also have deafness and blindness because the bone will actually impinge on uh, nerves. There's no ruffled border on histology in this condition. Pycnodysostosis, also called Toulouse-Lautrec syndrome for the French artist. This is an autosomal, an autosomal re uh, recessive disorder. This is an, a cathepsin K deficiency. It's a lysosomal distorage disease, which creates osteoclast dysfunction because of a lack of cathepsin K. So these patients will have short stature and dense and brittle bones. On histology, the lamellae will be quite disorganized, as seen in, in this picture here. So the interplay between rank and rank ligand is very important for osteoblasts and osteoclasts to communicate with each other. Rank is a receptor on osteoclasts. Rank ligand is a protein produced by osteoblasts, which stimulates osteoclasts. So when rank, when rank ligand is produced, it stimulates the osteoclast to go into action. Osteoprotegrin is also a protein produced by osteoblasts, but this inhibits osteoclasts. So rank ligand stimulates osteoclasts, osteoprotegrin inhibits osteoclasts. These are all produced by osteoblasts. You can remember osteoprotegrin keeps the bone in. It resists, or it, it turns the osteoclasts off and prevents them from breaking down bone. The interplay between rank ligand and osteoprotegrin is also important to determine how fast bone will break down. Again, rank ligand increases, increases bone resorption, osteoprotegrin decreases bone resorption. So again, osteoprotegrin keeps the bone in. Osteoclast markers include tartrate-resistant acid phosphatase, calcitonin receptor, and cathepsin K. Denusumab is a pharmacological uh, medication uh, which inhibits rank ligand. They use, use this for osteoporosis because it blocks rank ligand's effect on the osteoclast. So again, the osteoblast-osteoclast interplay is very important for bone turnover and bone mass regulation. I like this slide here uh, because it can show how bone is produced and how bone is resorbed and how increased formation or decreased formation can, can play a role in how bone, uh, the bone metabolism or decreased resorption or increased resorption as well. So on the top of the slide is osteoblast function, the bottom of the slide is, is osteoclast function. So it's important to realize that weight bearing is important for bone formation. Growth, fracture, and as well as sclerosis antibody can all increase bone formation. If you want to decrease bone formation, it's typically things like malnutrition, aging, chronic disease, those types of things which shut down osteoblasts from forming new bone. If you want to maintain bone mass, you can also decrease resorption. So again, weight bearing will decrease resorption. Also, the different kinds of hormones, including estrogen, testosterone, um, these all can help to increase uh, or, or decrease the osteoclast uh, function. IL-10 is an important uh, substance that also decreases osteoclast activity, as well as bisphosphonates. If you increase resorption, as you see in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide, you have uh, decreased bone mass. Things like parathyroid hormone, rank ligand, uh, malignancy, or inadequate calcium intake. These can all decrease, or excuse me, increase bone resorption. So bone mineralization is also very important. The two main minerals in bone are calcium and phosphate, as we talked about in the, in the hydroxyapatite. Calcium is mostly maintained within bone, but it has other functions outside of bone as well. It's important for muscle contraction, nerve conduction, and blood clotting. 
It's absorbed from the GI, GI tract, it's also resorbed from bone, and it's regulated by the kidneys and the vitamin T metabolism. Phosphate is mostly uh, contained in bone as well. It also has other functions, including enzyme systems, as well as molecular interactions. It's important to note that increased serum phosphate will lead to increased parathyroid hormone release and increased bone resorption uh, as well. Daily requirements. For calcium, uh, these are important numbers to know. Patients who are lactating or pregnant will, will require uh, more calcium uh, than the average adult, and also those patients who have fractures, it's important to supplement them with calcium. The normal adult requires about 700, uh, 750 milligrams per day. The daily requirement of phosphate is typically within a, a normal diet. Calcitonin and parathyroid hormone are the two hormones which are most important for, for bone um, metabolism. Calcitonin is secreted by the C cells of the thyroid gland. These inhibit osteoclast number and activity. Increased serum calcium will lead to increased calcitonin secretion, which will lead to osteoclast inhibition, which overall will lead to decreased serum calcium. So the net effect of calcitonin is decreased serum calcium. Recombinant calcitonin can be used to treat a number of different diseases. Parathyroid hormone is secreted by the chief cells of the parathyroid gland. These stimulate osteoblasts to secrete interleukins, uh, to, oste to activate the osteoclasts. It's important to realize that osteoclasts have no parathyroid hormone receptors. So even though parathyroid hormone works to activate osteoclasts, they do not they, they, uh, the osteoclast does not have parathyroid hormone receptors. The net effect of parathyroid hormone is to increase serum calcium and decrease serum phosphate. So we can add calcitonin to osteopotegrin. Calcitonin and osteopotegrin keeps the bone in. That's the mnemonic for uh, how these work. Osteoporosis is obviously something that all of us see daily in our practice. This is a, a condition in which the bone metabolism balance favors the osteoclasts. These patients actually have normal mineralization of their bone, but decreased bone mass. Uh, to, defined as bone density 2.5 standard deviations below that of a young adult. So you're comparing these patients to young adults. The treatment is important to supplement calcium and vitamin D in their diet, and medications include bisphosphonates and calcitonin to treat this. Bisphosphonates are an important medication for the orthopedic surgeon to understand. These medicines inhibit osteoclasts. There's two different main types. There's the, those that contain nitrogen, such, such as alendronate, uh, which create dysfunctional osteoclasts, or those that do not contain nitrogen, such as etidronate, which causes uh, osteoclast apoptosis. Uh, these are the mechanisms, as you can see. The non-nitrogen-containing uh, medications inhibit ATP production, which results in osteoclast apoptosis, so basically kills the osteoclast. The nitrogen-containing uh, has a different pathway. It inhibits pro protein prenylation, which inhibits farnesyl pyrophosphate synthase. Uh, these are the different types of non-nitrogen and nitrogen-containing. It's important to note that the non-nitrogen-containing are not nearly as potent as the nitrogen-containing. The nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates are about 1,000 times more potent than the non-nitrogen-containing. Risks of bisphosphonates have been well documented. I think the most important one for us to recognize is the related fractures that you see. Here you see a subtrochanteric femur fracture from bisphosphonate use. And some patients who have been on chronic bisphosphonates will develop this type of fracture pattern. IV administration of bisphosphonates has been associated with osteonecrosis of the jaw. Bone remodeling is constantly occurring uh, throughout a person's life. It's uh, basically caused by these osteoclastic cutting cones with osteoblasts which lay, which lay down bone behind it. So you have layering of these osteoblasts and deposition of these osteoid lamellae. This is how the uh, lamellae of the bone are formed. It's important to remember that Wolf's Law helps to guide remodeling. The bone remodeling occurs in response to the mechanical stress that the bone sees. So the bone must receive stress in order for it to remodel properly. The compression side of bone is electronegative, which stimulates osteoblasts. The tension side is electropositive, which stimulates the osteoclasts. Paget's disease is an important disease to understand because it's uh, associated with abnormal bone remodeling. So here you have mosaic lamellar bone. These patients will have bone pain, enlarged bones. This is a classic x-ray of the skull uh, where you can see the uh, abnormal bone formation. These patients frequently have deafness or cranial nerve dysfunction because of compression of the, ner of the cranial nerves by um, abnormal bone formation. Labs will include elevated serum alkaline phosphatase. This can be treated uh, effectively with bisphosphonates.
there's two different types of way bone forms, inchondral ossification and, and intramembranous ossification. And chondral ossification is how, really how the, the, the long bones of the skeleton form. It's also important because this is how fractures heal in most cases. You'll have inchondral ossification occurring at your growth plates as well as fractured callus. Here you have bone or osteoid, which replaces the cartilage frame. Intramembranous ossification is osteoid without a cartilage frame. Basically, here you have aggregates of mesenchymal stem cells, which differentiate an osteoblast, which, which essentially form bone. So this is how the flat bones form, the clavicles, the scapula, and the, and the, and the uh, bones of the skull. It's also the way that distraction osteogenesis forms bone. The physis, I think it's important for us to understand the different layers of the physis and how they work and what's in with, with each one. So the reserve zone is going to be the resting cartilage. Uh, we have resting chondrocytes that are preparing to proliferate in order to form uh, the growing uh, skeleton. The proliferative zone is when the chondrocytes start to stack. Here you have higher oxygen tension. The, the hypertrophic zone is where chondrocytes start to mature and really hypertrophy. Uh, this is where you start seeing the, uh, the large um, chondrocytes and they start to form, cal they start to calcify and eventually become the metaphysis where you have the primary and the secondary spongiosa. It's important to note that in the, t in the uh, reserve and proliferative zone, this is usually cartilage or this is cartilage and so you have type two collagen. In the hypertrophic zone, especially the calcified area, you've got collagen type 10. This is one of the few places in the body you'll find collagen type 10. And in the, in the um, metaphysis, uh, you have bone here, so again, collagen type 1 in the metaphysis. There are certain diseases that which uh, are associated with each, with, each, with each zone. In the reserve zone, you have diseases such as Gaucher's disease, uh, Nice disease, diastrophic dysplasia. The proliferative zone, you'll have the, both the very large and the very small, so gigantism and achondroplasia. The hypertrophic zone is seen as the weakest zone of the physis. Here is where you have your physeal fractures, your slip capital femoral epiphyses. You also have rickets and, and osteomalacia because this is where you're trying to calcify your cartilage in order to uh, form uh, your metaphysis. This is where you have the primary bony issues, uh, such as, um, um, uh, such as the, uh, the uh, osteopetrosis and things of this nature. A chondroplasia, as we mentioned, this is a, a, a dysfunction of the zone of proliferation. Fibrogla fibroblast growth factor re receptor 3. Again, it's an inhibition of chondrocyte proliferation. These patients have short stature, trident hands very commonly, lumbar kyphosis and stenosis. These are important manifestations. Here you see uh, our friend from Game of Thrones who has a chondroplasia. The heuter volkman principle is important in that this is how the physis responds to stress. Compressive force inhibits growth tensile force stimulates growth. This is an important concept when cons considering diseases such as Blount's disease, obesity valgus, and scoliosis. Bone healing has three phases. The first phase is the inflammatory phase. This occurs from within minutes of the fracture to weeks after the fracture. Here you have hematoma formation and the inflow of multiple inflammatory mediators. This is granulation tissue. The reparative phase occurs weeks to months after the fracture. Here's where you have soft callus becoming hard callus. You have chondrogenesis, which ends up becoming bone via inchondral ossification. Remodeling occurs for months to years after the fracture. Here's where you have your bone remodeling using cutting cones and eventually will lay down compact lamellar bones. Callus formation occurs after fracture. If you have high strain with, with a fracture, you'll have high, uh, a preponderance of fibrous tissue that will form. If you have intermediate strain with low oxygen tension, you'll have cartilage development. Initially, it will be type 2 collagen replaced by type 1 collagen as the fracture stabilizes and undergoes inchondral ossification. In fractures with low strain and high oxygen tension, here's where you have immature or woven bone, form bone formation. The amount of callus is inversely proportional to the extent of mobilization. So the less stable the fracture, the more callus you'll see. Delayed unions or non-unions may occur uh, in several different situations. Hypertrophic non-unions occur if you have inadequate immobilization, but you have adequate blood supply. So you have hypertrophic formation of fibrous tissue. Atrophic uh, non-unions may occur if you have inadequate immobilization with inadequate blood supply, as seen in this picture here. Here, we do not have enough nutrition in order for the fracture to heal. Oligotrophic uh, non-unions may occur with inadequate reduction. There's many different factors which influence fracture healing. They can be grouped into biological factors or patient factors or mechanical, fra uh, me mechanical factor factors. 
Biological factors include the patient's age, nutritional status, whether or not he or she smokes, infection, vascular injury. Me mechanical factors are typically related to the stability of the fracture, the anatomic location, the level of energy imparted within the fracture, and whether there's any bone loss. Heterotopic ossification is the abnormal development of bone and soft tissues. Generally, you have a tissue injury, the vascular endothelial cells become mesenchymal stem cells, which eventually become osteoblasts via uh, transcription growth factors. You will have increased heterotopic ossification in patients with traumatic brain injuries and those with spinal cord injuries. Some patients have a genetic predisposition to heterotopic ossification, such as those with HLA B27. Uh, NSAIDs can be used to prevent this. Cartilage. So the two types of cartilage we'll be discussing today include hyaline cartilage and fibrocartilage. Hyaline cartilage is the articular cartilage, is type 2 collagen. Fibrocartilage is the non-articular cartilage, type 1 collagen. So again, articular cartilage is hyaline cartilage, type 2 collagen. It's got characteristics which are important to it. Mainly, it's avascular, aneural, and alymphatic. Because it's avascular and aneural, it's got a very limited healing potential. The nutrition of articular cartilage is diffusion from the synovial fluid. It really has no blood supply, so all nutrition comes from the synovial fluid. The properties which are important include that it's anisotropic, which means the properties of the material vary with the direction of force applied. It's biphasic, meaning that it has both liquid and solid properties, and it's viscoelastic, meaning it has time-dependent strain, and it varies by rate of loading. So anisotropic would include the picture in the top right where the imprint of the person's hand is on the mattress. It basically, once you remove the force, it slowly returns back to its normal state. Its functions include a frictionless bearing surface. Uh, it's much smoother than ice on ice. The coefficient of friction, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner here, is much smoother than ice on ice. It resists compression. It also distributes load across the joint. Its composition is mainly water, number one by weight, 70% water. The water content is highest at the surface. As you age, cartilage becomes dry and, and the water content is decreased. In osteoarthritis, the water content is actually increased. Osteoarthritis is wet. 25% is collagen and proteoglycans, and less than 5% is chondrocytes. So as far as the dry weight of articular cartilage, again, 60% of, of this is collagen, 95% of which is type 2 collagen. So remember, bone and fiber cartilage is type 1. Articular cartilage is type 2. Proteoglycans form approximately 30%, and then the rest is chondrocytes. Collagen provides much of the tensile strength. Proteoglycans, much of the compressive strength. The proteoglycans also help to act as a sponge, as we'll talk about in a second. So the chondrocyte is the only cell of cartilage. It has the anaerobic metabolism, is mechanosensitive, is metabolically active, and it makes and maintains the cartilage matrix. It produces collagen and proteoglycans. The chondrocyte also comes from mesenchymal uh, stem cell lineage, but the transcription growth factor here is SOX9. So SOX9 tells the mesenchymal stem cells to differentiate into chondrocytes or chondroblasts. Remember that osteoblasts, it's RUNX2, CBFA1, chondrocytes, SOX9. The matrix function acts both as a sponge and as a spring. Proteoglycans are what allow that. So these proteoglycans, I'm sure we've all seen these pictures before, are these large mega molecules, excuse me, these large mega molecules formed of a hyaluronic acid backbone with glycosaminoglycan chains, chondroitin sulfate, keratin sulfate, dermatin sulfate. The one thing that should be important, all of these in the word sulfate. So these are sulfate uh, glycosaminoglycan chains. These provide both compressive and elastic strength. These long sulfate chains have negative charges. The like charges repel the same way that two uh, same ends of a magnet will repel. The negative charges also attract positive cations, increase osmotic pressure, and fluid pressurization helps to provide compressive strength in cartilage. So with weight bearing, the load will squeeze the proteoglycan spring. This will compress the fluid out. This also provides a thin layer of fluid on the surface of the cartilage for lubrication of the joint. With non-weight bearing, the proteoglycan's charges repel each other. It inflates the matrix spuns. The fluid which comes in provides turgor and also nourishes the cartilage. 
Diastrophic dysplasia, we're talking about the sulfate chains on, on these different glycomium glycans. It's a sulfate transporter defect. These patients, this is a very classically tested one because these are dwarfs or twisted dwarfs with very short extremities. They need to have hitchhiker type thumbs, cauliflower ears. So there's a sulfate transporter defect. And again, these are classic clinical manifestations. Uh, a, a mnemonic for diastrophic dysplasia, if your sulfate transporter is not working, you will need to hitchhike. You have hitchhiker thumbs with diastrophic dysplasia, sulfate transporter dysfunction. So talking about proteoglycans, they're degraded by these lysosomal enzymes. Lysosomes are basically sacs of enzymes that digest these large molecules and pass the fragments on to be, re to be recycled. If you have defective enzymes, it allows these large molecules to accumulate within the cell, eventually killing it. So this brings us to mucopolysaccharidoses. These are lysosome enzyme deficiencies which show up in the test from time to time. The proteoglycan byproducts accumulate in the cell and you have a progressive clinical picture. These patients will become uh, more mentally challenged as they get older, except for more Keogh syndrome, also associated with hepatosplenomegaly. The four types that they are commonly tested uh, are types one through four. Uh, type two or, her, uh, or hunter is, is commonly tested because it's different, it's X-linked as far as its, uh, its inheritance pattern. Type four or more Keogh syndrome is by far the most common. These are abnormal cognition. Again, these are the excess proteoglycans in the middle column here. Gaucher's disease is the most common lysosomal storage disorder. It's autosomal recessive, very commonly seen in Ashkenazi Jews. This is a glucocerebrosidase defect. You have Erlenmeyer flask femurs. These are the orthopedic manifestations. Erlenmeyer flask femurs, also associated with osteonecrosis of the femoral head. These patients frequently have hepatosplenomegaly and anemia. So articular cartilage layers are important for the orthopedic surgeon to remember. Again, we have a superficial layer, a middle layer, a deep layer, and eventually the cartilage will attach to the subchondral bone here. The superficial layer or tangential layer is the most superficial layer in the joint. Uh, this has a thin lamina splendens. The collagen here is parallel to the surface because there's a lot of shear here. Here you have the, the highest collagen percentage uh, as far as um, uh, by volume, so the highest collagen percentage. Strength here is against shear. Also very high water content and the fewest proteoglycans. In the middle layer, the transitional layer, you have an oblique fiber orientation. The collagen here is larger in diameter. Here you're supplying compressive strength to the articular surface. You have lower water, but higher proteoglycans because again, you're supplying compressive strength here. So with compressive strength, you need more proteoglycans. The radial layer is where the collagen fibers become perpendicular as it approaches the tide mark. Here you have larger collagen diameter. You have, again, resistance to shear as you go from the middle layer to the subchondral bone. Very high proteoglycans here as well. At the tide mark, we have the calcified cartilage. Uh, this is where you transition from flexible cartilage to stiff bone. Like the uh, hypertrophic zone of the physis, you also have type 10 collagen here. Injuries below this layer will heal with fibrocartilage. It's important to recognize that's how microfracture works. You violate the calcified cartilage and subchondral plate to generate fibrocartilage for the healing process of microfracture. Osteoarthritis is a condition where you have loss of the smooth lamina. You have loss of proteoglycan content, smaller aggregates. Here you have increased water content and increased matrix permeability. This is an inflammatory disorder. Uh, we have inflammatory breakdown of cartilage. It's a, it's a degradative process. Again, remember osteoarthritis is wet. You have a higher water content with osteoarthritis. Now with aging, you have a lack of an anabolic response. So we talked about osteoarthritis as a degradative process where you actually have uh, inflammatory mediators which help to uh, cause osteoarthritis. With aging, you have a lack of response to growth factors. You have decreased matrix production and it produces dry and brittle cartilage. So osteoarthritis has an increased water content. Normal aging has decreased water content. Uh, this is a, a table of the skeletal dysplasias we discussed. I think it's important when you're putting together these, uh, trying to study for these tests, that you make tables like this so that you can include the disorder, the defect, and then the, the clinical manifestation. These are very commonly tested. And again, these are pretty, uh, if, you, if you can remember, memorize some, some of these uh, defects and some of the manifestations, you can uh, get questions right because of that. So now to talk about perioperative problems. Probably the one that's most pressing to orthopedic surgeons is venous thromboembolic disease, or DVTs, PEs. 
So here you have thrombosis, which is clotting at an improper site, or embolism, which is a clot that migrates. So VTE, which would include P, uh, DVTs and PEs, most are clinically silent. People will develop these without you even knowing it. But if you do have clinical symptoms, a lot of times you'll have unilateral swelling. The highest risk for VTE is going to be after arthroplasty or lower extremity trauma. These can be fatal, as uh, suggested by the, uh, the uh, uh, picture at the bottom right. Verkaus triad is the important uh, uh, thing to remember when considering VTE. Here you have hypercoagulability, endothelial damage, and stasis. These are all situations which may occur in an orthopedic patient. So endothelial damage occurs with surgical insult, tissue trauma, or manipulation of the limb. What happens is collagen is exposed, which triggers platelets to form a clot. Platelets' primary role is to, to start hemostasis. So platelets will come in and adhere to the injured collagen to create a clot. Here you have platelet aggregation, and those platelets will secrete a number of prothrombotic mediators, and this is where the clots start. Stasis, another common situation with post-orthopedic patients, is allows these clots to basically propagate. Um, you have this with immobility, the position for the exposure. If you have increased blood viscosity, decreased inflow, such as with tourniquet usage or peripheral artery disease, or decreased outflow, such as in, chronic, um, which is in congestive heart failure or venous disease. Finally, hypercoagulability. This is probably what's uh, most important for us to understand because this is where our treatments will come in handy. So with hypercoagulability, you either have increased clotting factors or decreased anticoagulants in the blood. The end result of the clotting cascade is insoluble fibrin. This is the clot. So these, this is the clotting cascade that we probably remember from medical school. It's important to remember that uh, everything that's in green here is vitamin K uh, dependent, okay? So the vitamin de K dependent um, factors include factor two, factor seven, factor nine, and factor 10. Also proteins at CNS. So vitamin K is essential to these factors. And this is the factors on which Coumadin or uh, Warfarin will act. Proteins C and proteins S are anti uh, an antithrombin or anticoagulants. So, so these are also important uh, to maintain um, a normal uh, coagulation uh, situation in the person. So there's a number of different types of uh, conditions that the patient might have, which will lead to increased uh, uh, risk for blood clot. These would include decreased anti-clotting factors or increased clotting factors. So the most common decreased anti-clotting factors include antithrombin-3 deficiency, protein C deficiency, and protein S deficiency. So patients with, de with deficiencies in these anti-clotting factors are more prone to clot. The most common coagul uh, coagulopathy that we see is factor V Leiden. Okay, this is the most common inherited clotting disorder. As you can see, those patients with factor V Leiden will have the, a very high propensity to have DVTs after orthopedic surgery. Another one is of importance is elevated factor eight. So factor, elevated factor eight may be seen in a number of different types of situations, including high BMI, older patients, patients with diabetes. It should be noted that low factor eight is actually what's, uh, what causes hemophilia type A. So there are a number of risk factors that we can talk about for VTE. Again, Verkau's uh, triad is important to recognize. All orthopedic patients are basically at risk for VTE by virtue of the fact they've undergone orthopedic surgery. It's also important that age is a very, very important risk factor. So the older a patient is, the higher chance that we'll have a blood clot. Um, other other um, risk factors include pregnancy, uh, smoking, diabetes, and, and these things listed here. It should be noted that prior DVT has a four to eight time increased risk of recurrent DVT. Post-thrombotic syndrome occurs up to 50% of patients who've had a previous DVT. It may manifest as chronic venous insufficiency, venous hypertension, chronic skin issues, pigmentation, induration, and ulcers. This is worse with larger DVTs. The DVT diagnosis can be kind of frustrating. Usually you'll see unilateral swelling or pain uh, or a positive Homan sign, which is when you squeeze the calf with ankle and dorsal flexion, they have re reproducible pain here. But we know the symptoms are often equivocal. Many patients with DVT seen on imaging will have no signs or symptoms, and many patients with classic signs will have no DVT on imaging. Uh, so it, is, it, is, it can be a difficult diagnostic situation. The DVT ultrasound is the most reliable and uh, reproducible test for DVT. 
Uh, what you're looking for here is a non-compressible vein or no flow. These can be very sensitive and specific for DVT. As we know, these are operator dependent. So some, some, some uh, DVTs uh, requires the operator to be very good at, at, at trying to find these things. These are best for proximal DVTs, those that occur between the inguinal ligament and the popliteal fossa. It should be noted that the AOS has advised against routine screening for DVT. So it's okay to test for DVT if the patient has symptoms, but you should not routinely screen your patient for DVTs. The diagnosis of PE can also be challenging. These patients, again, are also often asymptomatic, but those patients with pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea, or tachypnea uh, should be looked at for potentially having a PE. The labs here can, are not very helpful. Most patients who have recently had orthopedic surgery or an injury will have elevated labs that would uh, make a PE difficult to uh, um, uh, rule out. Um, the ABG can be helpful. Patients with hypocapnia or respiratory alkalosis, even though their PaO2 may be normal. An EKG should be ordered on these patients who may potentially have a PE for a number of reasons, but for one, to rule out myocardial infarction. On EKG, you'll see tachycardia or right ventricular strain. The VQ scan and pulmonary angiography have historically been an important test for this, but most patients now undergo a CT uh, pulmonary angiography. This is a CT scan which looks at the blood flow within the, within, the, uh, within the lungs. This does require contrast, and it should be noted that this is a very, very sensitive test. In fact, it may be oversensitive. We found this out. Basically, we're looking at the, the diagnosis of PE. It's much more common for us to diagnose PE in orthopedic patients using the CTPA, but should we know that the, PA, the PEs that were diagnosed by CTPA, even though we, we were diagnosing them with increased frequency, we did not actually decrease their mortality by diagnosing them. Patients who are overtreated for, for DVT or PE may have more bleeding complications. So prophylaxis and treatment. There's a number of mechanical agents that I think orthopedic surgeons should be aware of. The most important of which are probably the SCDs or plantar compression devices. These basically stimulate the, the fibrinolytic system within the body and decrease venous stasis. So they actually encourage um, um, blood flow as well. Stockings or compressive stockings may be used in patients' lower extremities to produce a pressure differential between the legs and the proximal um, extremity. IVC filters are retrievable devices that can be used in patients who have a current D, uh, DVT or, or uh, a blood clot and cannot or cannot receive chemoprophylaxis. These are retrieved electively after surgery. There are a number of pharmacological agents. Uh, heparin binds to antithrombin 3. This will inhibit thrombin as well as factor 10A. Low molecular weight heparin, such as anoxaparin, inhibits factor 10A directly. There's a higher risk of bleeding with low molecular weight heparin than compared to warfarin. Warfarin is probably the most uh, tried and true of the pharmacological agents. This is an anti-vitamin K uh, medication. It prevents the synthesis of factors 2, 7, 9, 10, as well as proteins C and S. It's important to note that warfarin requires uh, monitoring of the patient's PT, INR, to ensure you've not over-anticoagulated them. Aspirin is being used with increased frequency for DVT prophylaxis in orthopedic patients. This is an irreversible COX inhibitor. It also blocks platelet aggregation and platelet production, as well as production of thromboxane too. There are a number of thrombo uh, excuse me, there are a number of factor 10A inhibitors, which include fondaparinux, rivaroxaban, uh, and apixaban. So any of the of the medications which contain XABAN block factor 10A. So the Zabins block factor 10A. So if this is on the test, these block factor 10A on the, on the clotting cascade. These agents all have a reversal agent. Heparin has protamine sulfate. Uh, it can be administered to someone who's over anticoagulated on heparin. Low molecular weight heparin, protamine sulfate can also be used, but does not have as strong a uh, uh, function as it does on heparin. Uh, for warfarin, vitamin K, or fresh fro frozen plasma, the vitamin K can help create the factors which have been blocked by warfarin. The fresh frozen plasma can, can uh, re uh, replenish the uh, clotting factors. And aspirin, as it binds to platelets, can be treated uh, uh, with platelets. The Academy has come out with a number of guidelines as far as DVT prophylaxis in patients who undergo total hip arthroplasty or total knee arthroplasty. Again, this is based on evidence. They make a strong recommendation against the routine use of postoperative DVT uh, ultrasound screening. As far as moderate guidelines, they recommend the use of a pharmacological and or mechanical compressive devices for patients who are not at risk for VTE or bleeding beyond ba just the surgery itself. So that's a moderate recommendation from the Academy. There's a number of consensus guidelines they have in the absence of reliable evidence that orthopedic surgeons should utilize when they're trying to assess patients for DVT or PE prophylaxis after surgery. 
It's important for all OSB surgeons to, to assess for coagulopathy and risk factors. It's important to discuss that prophylaxis with your patients. Those patients who've had a prior DVT or PE should receive some sort of pharmacological and mechanical prophylaxis. Those patients who have a known bleeding disorder should receive mechanical, mechanical prophylaxis only. It's important for all orthopedic patients to undergo early mobilization. The AOS has no recommendation for any particular agent or dosing regimen for prophylaxis. So it's basically with the, up to the orthopedic surgeon's discretion. So ARDS is another post-operative complication that's important for orthopedic, orthopedic surgeons to recognize. This is adult respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. This is lung failure caused by edema. This is the complement pathway has been activated here, and leukocytes and free radicals have been recruited into the area of the lungs. Uh, you have inflammatory uh, enzymes and proteases which occur in here. Ultimately, you have increased pulmonary capillary permeability, uh, which causes this ARDS. Uh, with, with ARDS, you have intravascular fluid and protein leaking into the interstitium alveoli. It manifests as hypoxemia, pulmonary hypertension, and right-sided heart failure. ARDS is very dangerous as a 50% mortality rate, so it should be, rec it should be recognized early um, if it's developing. Potential causes include blood stress trauma, aspiration pneumonia, diffuse infectious pneumonia, shocks and burns, long bone fractures, and sepsis. The clinical presentation will be tachypnea, dyspnea, and hypoxemia. The uh, uh, PaO2 to FiO2 ratio is going to be less than 200 millimeters of mercury, and you'll have reduced lung compliance. The chest x-ray will show diffuse bilateral uh, infiltrates and an, an increased interstitial fluid, as seen in these pictures here to the right. The treatment, it's important for these patients to receive 100% oxygen by non-rebreather. It's important to identify and treat any causes, including infection and fractures, and the ventilation should, be, should include PEEP, or positive end expiratory pressure. This will open and recruit alveoli to improve ventilation. Fat emboli syndrome is another condition seen in, in orthopedic patients as well. This has a classic clinical triad. Anytime there's a classic clinical triad, this is fodder for test questions. The triad is gonna be a particular rash neurological symptoms, and pulmonary collapse. So you have fat to the skin, fat to the brain, and fat to the lungs. It always occurs, or usually occurs, after initial asymptomatic period. So again, the triad's gonna be rash, neurological symptoms, and pulmonary problems. The rash is pathognotic for fat emboli syndrome. This occurs in the upper anterior part of the body because fat floats. So the patient will have basically a rash of their chest, their neck, their shoulder, and their axilla. Also, the conjunctiva of their eyes may show evidence of, uh, of, um, of this fat emboli syndrome. Altered mental status, these are the neurological complaints. Patients will have confusion or stupor. In severe cases, you might have rigidity, seizures, or coma as the fat embolizes to the, uh, to the brain. And the pulmonary symptoms, this is the most dangerous part of fat emboli syndrome. Patients who have fat emboli syndrome can develop ARDS which is, again, hypoxemia, or hypoxia, tachypnea, and dyspnea. Also, of elevated heart rate. The chest x-ray will show a snowstorm. The CT scan will be ground glass. What happens with fat emboli syndrome is long bone fractures cause fat emboli in up to 90% of patients, but only about less than 1% will actually develop any, any signs of fat emboli syndrome. These patients will have an asymptomatic interval between 24 and 72 hours. As the fat globules are hydrolyzed into irritating fatty acids, the fatty acids are what lead to the clinical issues uh, because these are very irritating to the uh, tissues within the lung. The prophylaxis for fat emboli syndrome is early stabilization of long bone fractures to prevent uh, further fat emboli from forming. Again, you treat this primarily for the ARDS with ventilation and, and positive and expiratory pressure. Shock is often seen in trauma patients or the orthopedic patients. This is cardiovascular collapse with hypotension followed by impaired tissue perfusion and cellular hypoxia. The four types most commonly seen include hypovolemic, cardiogenic, septic, and neurogenic. Hypovolemic shock is the most common shock caused by trauma. So here basically you have blood loss, either volume loss from bleeds and or burns. Uh, you, you have decreased cardiac output, which leads despite, to a, uh, despite a rapid pulse. So even though your heart's beating faster, you have decreased cardiac output. 
you have increased peripheral vascular resistance, the blood pressure actually may be elevated because the, the blood vessels are clamping down to try to maximize the volume. You have vascular constriction. The patient's extremities will be pale, cold, and clammy. So the percent blood loss is going to be important for how the vital signs are acting. Up to 15% 15, 15 of a blood loss, so, uh, you'll have normal vital signs because the body does a pretty good job of maintaining their vital signs. With blood loss up to uh, 15 to 30%, the heart rate will increase, and you'll have increased diastolic blood pressure as, as you have uh, peripheral vascular resistance increases. Uh, with blood loss from 30 to 40%, here you have a decreased systolic blood pressure, oliguria, and you'll start having mental status changes. Blood loss of greater than 40% is considered life-threatening. Here you'll have a, a narrowed pulse pressure because your systolic pressure and your diastolic pressure are starting to get closer together. Very often you'll have immeasurable diastolic blood pressure here. So it's important to recognize these symptoms of hypovolemic shock. The, the uh, treatment for hypovolemic shock is fluid replacement. You've got to get two large bore IV catheters and, 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 and infuse lactated ringers normal saline at a high rate. It's important to get volume back into the body so they maintain cardiac output. If you want to assess fluid replacement, the urine output is a very good place to start. Any urine output less than 30 cc's per hour is a good clinical indicator of inadequate replacement. So it's important to get the urine output up to at least 30 cc's per hour. The best lab for inadequate replacement is, is serum lactate. So the serum lactate will be formed in anaerobic metabolism. If you have elevated serum lactate of over 2.5, that's typically inadequate replacement. So you want to get the serum lactate under 2.5. Occult hyperperfusion may occur when the vital signs and urine output is okay, but lactate is still elevated. And so it's important to recognize that lactate is an important lab to determine fluid replacement. Cardiogenic shock is when the heart's not working very well. Either you have a bad pump or a blocked pump. So patients who have a myocardial infarction or a rhythm problem, or those who have a blocked pump, meaning a tamponade, a pneumothorax, or a massive PE, uh, can have cardiogenic shock. Septic shock is something we see commonly in patients with infections. This is caused by bacterial toxins. Gram-negative infections may cause an endotoxin to the bacterial cell wall, whereas the uh, gram-positive staph toxic shock syndrome is, is, is created by the staph aureus. This causes release of inflammatory cytokines, including uh, TNF, IL-1, IL-6, IL-8. It causes systemic vasodilation, which creates hypotension. So you have systemic vasodilation as opposed to hypovolemic shock, we actually have uh, vasoconstriction. The coagulation cascade is activated, so you might have uh, disseminated inter intravascular coagulation with these patients. You also have endothelial activation. Sometimes patients with septic shock may develop ARDS. It's a very high mortality rate with septic shock. It's the number one cause of ICU death. The most common cause of septic shock in orthopedic patients is necrotizing fasciitis. Neurogenic shock may ca be caused with a spinal cord injury. Uh, you have paralysis and loss of sensation. With the loss, uh, with the loss of sympathetic tone, you have peripheral blood pulling. You have hypotension and bradycardia. This is one of the few times when, you, when you're in shock when the heart rate will not elevate. You have bradycardia. The treatment for this is fluid and vasopressors. Malignant hyperthermia. This is a condition seen in patients who receive uh, halothane type anesthetics or, or, uh, or anesthetic agents like a succinylcholine, which is a muscle um, um, a paralytic agent. This is caused by a ryanodine receptor defect in the sarcoplasmic reticulum of muscle. With malignant hypothermia, you have sustained muscle contractions, which leads to rigidity and spasms. Patients will develop rhabdomyolysis, which may result in acute renal failure hyperkalemia, which may cause rhythm problems in the heart, and an increased metabolic rate, which will elevate the temperature. The earliest sign is going to be actually end tidal CO2 elevation when the patient is breathing out they have an increase in end tidal CO2. Increased temperature is actually a late finding. So again, if you have an unexplained rise in end tidal CO2, that's the earliest sign of malignant hypothermia. It's the most sensitive and most specific. Frequently, these patients will have masseter muscle spasm, Again, elevated temperature is a late finding. Some patients are at high risk for this, such as those with central core disease, those with muscular dystrophies, and other, other conditions such, such as arthrogryposis or osteogenesis imperfecta. The treatment, the number one treatment is going to be dantrolene, which decreases intracellular calcium. It stabilizes the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It is also important, important to be supportive of these patients and to balance their electrolytes, hydrate, maintain the urinary output, respiratory support, and, and proper cooling to get their body temperature down. 
surgical nutrition. Most orthopedic patients are actually malnourished, and up to 60% of elderly patients are malnourished. Healing of fractures and other injuries requires energy. Uh, there are certain conditions that elevate your metabolic needs, including fever, fractures, and multi-trauma. Labs which are important to, to recognize are albumin, transferrin, and total lymphocyte. These labs may be useful when you're trying to determine whether an orthopedic patient is proper nutrition. Patients with low uh, lab values have up to a 40 to 50 percent healing complications and infections. Well, this is kind of a busy slide, but it's important, I think, to recognize the strategies which may help to decrease surgical site infection. Again, it's very important to maintain adequate nutrition, as labeled by these labs here. It's important to keep glucose levels within normal parameters. It's uh, for patients here to determine whether you're going to do extremity surgery on. The transcutaneous uh, membrane, uh, transcutaneous oxygen percentage is important. Uh, ankle brachial indices are important. Um, you can utilize monofilament sutures when closing wounds to prevent infections from occurring. It's important to clip, not shave. Prophylactic antibiotics should be given within one hour before and up to 24 hours after surgery. If the surgery lasts longer than four hours or if blood loss is greater than 1,000 cc's, it should be repeated. Also, if the patient's greater than 80 kilograms, it should be doubled. Smoking cessation is also very important to decrease surgical site infection. Medical ethics. So ethics in orthopedics are important, and these, this actually shows up in the test from time to time. The AOS standards of professionalism are the minimum standards by which orthopedic surgeons are judged when it comes to ethics. Violations of the AOS standards of professionalism may lead to uh, expulsion from the academy. It's also reportable to the National Practitioner Data Bank. There's four major principles here. Non-malfeasance, beneficence, autonomy, and justice. Non-malfeasance is the important Hippocratic oath, do no harm. It's important to treat conservatively for it first, indicate wisely, and avoid complications. It's important for the physician to research new treatment, understand uh, side effects, understand risks. Beneficence is basically the, the, uh, the concept of doing good. It's important for the doctor to improve the patient's condition, condition via competent and compassionate care. It's important for orthopedic surgeons to maintain competence, practice evidence-based medicine, and, result, and, and measure the results. Autonomy is the patient's personal rule of the self. Physicians must respect the treatment choices of patients who are well-informed. This includes concepts such as informed consent, patient-centered care, and AMA discharges. Paternalism is physicians directing care on behalf of patients who cannot otherwise consent for themselves. Justice implies equal treatment to all patients, fair distribution of healthcare resources, improving access to all patients. It's also important uh, that patients should not be denied care due to lack of ability to pay. So informed consent, there's three key elements. The provision of adequate information so the patient should know what they're actually consenting to, the comprehension of the, inf of the information by the person being asked to consent, and that the consent is actually voluntary. So these are the three elements of informed consent. Malpractice, there's four key elements here. Duty, breach of duty, causation, and damages. So duty is the patient's obligation, or excuse me, the physician's obligation to care for the patient consistent with the standard of care. A breach of duty occurs with the, if the physician fails to meet the standard of care. The causation is that the violation caused the injury. The damages are basically that the violation has created injuries that can be proved to be caused um, by the malpractice. Factors that lead to claim. The most important factor here is miscommunication. Patients want to communicate directly with their doctors, and if, if they, they perceive a lack of communication, it's a very important factor that may lead to a malpractice claim. Delay in response to patient concerns, failure to diagnose, failure to treat, and improper treatment. But again, it, it should be noted that, that the patients who like their doctors and communicate well with their doctors are much less likely to follow a claim. So that ends the basic science portion of the recertification course from JBGS Miller Review course. Thank you very much for your attention.